Thank you all for coming. I'd like to now introduce our Delray Beach Downtown Development Authority Board Chair, Mavis Benson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. It pays to have a TV personality on staff, doesn't it? Welcome, everybody. This is wonderful. I had no, ex no idea what to expect as far as uh, attendance, but this is fabulous. And I thank you all for taking the time to join us tonight. When you came in, you may have been asked to put on your, your name tag, um, list one thing that you love about Delray Beach. I don't see many on the name tags, but, oh, I have one here. So, can we just shout it out, one thing you love about Delray? The police department? Outreach team, okay. All right. All right. Mayor, could we have someone at your table give us something that, one word of what? Restaurants, okay. And Jeff, how about if we go over to your table? Anyone there want to share? Re All right. Big applause for that one. Okay. And Jeff Dash, your table. Anyone over there? Sarah? What? The experience? Naturally. All right. And Mr. Simon. Anyone at your table? One word. What do you love about Delray? I know, we could be here for a long time on that one, couldn't we? <laughs> Vibrancy. That's a key word these days. Remember that one. Maruska, your table. Art, absolutely. Okay, BJ, let's have your table. The Hospitality, okay, and, okay, Donna. Beaches, excellent, okay. Last table, saving the best for last. The beach, okay. Where, did I miss Vera? Oh, Vera, Henry. It's beautiful. That does de describe Delray. Hey. <laughs> so imagine this. You've never been to Delray. You've never seen Delray. You've never visited. But you're looking for a resort. And you see this ad or this article, and it reads, Beloved by locals and visitors, Delray Beach offers a two-mile stretch of pristine, family-friendly beach that steps away from the eclectic restaurants, boutiques, and art galleries that line Atlantic Avenue. If I were looking for a nice resort getaway, and if I had never been to Delray or visited Delray, and I saw this, I would say, sign me up. I'm so there. When we first moved to Delray, for at least a week, I kept thinking that room service was going to come in and clean my room and leave a chocolate on my pillow. I finally accepted that this was not the case and that I was living here and working in our downtown, which is the best resort in our city. I still pinch myself to make sure it's for real. What I love about Delray is the feeling of belonging, being a part of the community. Beyond my business, it gives me purpose. My birth certificate says birthplace, Williamston, North Carolina. But in my heart, I call Delray Beach my home. Now, I'd like to, first of all, let's introduce our city partners and uh, our commission. Let's start with our mayor, Mayor Petrolio. And then we have Deputy Vice, I mean Vice Mayor Ryan Bolston. Okay. Um, 
let's see, I see Assistant Police Chief Daryl Hunter. And let's see, Laura, help me out here. Who am I missing? That city manager, Assistant City Manager, Jeff, I'm so sorry, Jeff Oris. Okay, thank you guys. Oh, well, Missy's going to be recognized in a few minutes. So, Director of Public Works, Missy Barletto. Thank you, Missy. Missy always amazes me with when she's called up to the commission, she pops off, rattles off different information so quickly and effortlessly. I don't know how she keeps all of that in her mind. Okay, all right. Okay. And the uh, development. De what's. <laughs> you want to get. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. So, wait, give me one second. Sorry. Laura, okay. All right, so continuing with the introductions. So now I'd like to introduce our team. Suzanne Boyd, you know, Strategic mar uh, Marketing Manager. <laughs> Maruska Gatto, our Cultural Arts Director at the Cornell Museum. <laughs> Liliana Fino, Operations Coordinator, over there. Danielle Morian, Marketing Development Manager. And a new addition to the team, and one lucky guy, Devin Dwayne, Creative Marketing Coordinator. BJ Scalar, our Visitors Bit, uh, Center, she oversees. And you know our Executive Director, Laura Simon. Again, I am Mavis Benson, and I do chair the, um, the Downtown Development Authority Board. And I'd like to introduce our board members that are with us tonight. We have Vera Woodson and Frank Freyam. Frank is here? All right. Not here is Dr. John Condi, Mark Dinkler, Rocco Manguel, or our newest member, Christina Gabo, Gabo. They are missed. I have served on the Downtown Development Authority Board for six years. We do serve three-year terms. Some of our members have served from three to six to nine years. In June, four new member appointments will be made. It has been a privilege serving with a board and staff that is that is fiscally responsible for our taxpayers' dollars, reinvesting back into our downtown district through marketing, placemaking, and special events, which per our mission statement, quote, stimulates, enhances, and sustains the economic strength of downtown Delray Beach and the quality of life enjoyed by locals and visitors. There is, this is another reason that I love having my business in Delray. For $790.54, the DDA ad valorem tax for my business property offers me everything that you see in our annual report that's on your, in front of you on your table, so please read it. There's a lot of great information there. Serving on the DDA board is an honor which comes with great responsibility. We are appointed by our city commissioners, of whom are in that position, by being publicly elected officials. So by a few degrees of separation, you, the public, choose us. It was encouraging to see a list of 20 plus applications with a few other boards, unfortunately, have not as many. The DDA board seems to be a popular board. And as I said, we had over 20 applications uh, for, uh, to be considered for nomination. And it's been nice to see some of these applicants at our board and commission meetings. In fact, I think we have a few here tonight, which is good for them to be able to hear your thoughts and learn of your concerns with their, uh, throughout downtown. 
This will serve as a vital tool for all of us as well in our goal setting and in meetings throughout the year. As a collective group, Laura, staff, and board, we are all committed to and honored to serve the businesses, residents, and visitors in our DDA district. On their behalf, I thank you for joining us this evening. I now turn it over to our Executive Director, Laura Simon. Laura's professional as well as personal life inspires all of us to be our best selves and always do our best in the interest of those of whom we serve. Thank you, Mavis. I'm already crying. That's not good. I feel like, I feel like Missy. <laughs> um, so welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for being here. It's an honor and a privilege to serve in this position. Um, it's my hometown, uh, born and raised um, a long time ago um, in, in the 60s. I rocked the 60s, which is good. Uh, but born and raised here, um, and our family's been here since 1911. So we have some deep roots. My uh, family went to school at uh, Old School Square and now the Delray Beach uh, Elementary School and High School. My father's here tonight, Roy Simon, so <laughs> it feels good. It feels really good. And um, I just want to thank a few people before that Mavis didn't thank. Um, Peter Arts, I want to recognize as our past chair for many years. Thank you for your support, always. And he's also uh, a candidate for a reappointment, potentially, for as a board member going forward. So um, just, uh, just a few things. I'm going to skip forward. We're going to talk a little bit about the DDA. Um, and just for those that are maybe not familiar, just some reminders about who we are, what we do, why we're here, how old we are um, as an organization, and um, really what the, you know, what our, our mission is and, you know, and how we're funded. We have a map up here of our district. Everything happens in our district because it is about downtown. Our district expanded twice um, over the 50 years, both in 93 and 98. And we are funded by the one mill on the properties in the downtown. It's an additional tax that comes into our bank account and reinvested back into the community. So it is important, and it was started by the community and by my father, who led the charge, along with many people who volunteered their time, um, because cities are made of people. Communities are made of people. And it, is, it makes more of, you know, it is the heart of our city. It really is the vital organ that really it, it, it pumps and makes our city shine. So. They came out, they rescued it, they created an organization that could govern over the downtown and guide development, guide progress, guide all that happens here, and guide the vibrancy. So today, 52 years later, we're here to do the same thing. And we're here to make it shine, make it more vibrant, make it sustainable, and make it a place that, you know, my daughter, my granddaughter, wants to be... So it's super important for us to stay focused, stay focused on our mission, to work with everyone, to be um, collaborative, and to really, import, you know, just give back and really stay focused on the goal. That's our mission. So, <laughs> Don't make me cry. <laughs> Um, and I apologize because I love I love this town. You know it's really important. So I don't know why I'm crying. But um, um, so I want to get started because we have a lot of good stuff to talk about tonight. So just a little bit more about what the DDA does. So we do this with um, our mission. We've got a, all great partners here. We have the CRA that does a lot of great work. They are a huge partner for us. And I, it's all Renee, so I wanted to, to point out that because, you know, the, re, the CRA and the DDA uh, work really close together. We have um, similar statutes, but they have a bigger budget, so they're doing a lot more of the really the strong work on redeveloping our blighted communities and reinvesting. And then our organization, who has a smaller budget, but our organization is really to 
you know, make it run, make, keep the engine running, and once it's built, keep that engine running. So we do that through marketing and promotions. So we're the marketing arm for the downtown. Make people come here, make, come to our resort in our city, the number one resort. Make them, um, and then we also do a lot of events. So events that focus on and are driven by our businesses that are here so that people can come in and actually get the cash registers ringing. We just had a Mother's Day work at giveaway focused, and those came out of studies and plans that we also do, similar to the shopability report, that make it work. And if it's not working, we pivot. We move on to do something that's going to work for them. We do also the operations. So in the house, you see a lot of operations. We've got our clean and safe team in the back. This is a rock star team. <laughs> our ambassadors that are here. We have our uh, community team, our neighborhood services team that is also part of our clean and safe team that keeps the place focused on beautification and code. It's all working because the DDA looked at downtown as our home and said, how do we make it sustainable? How do we keep it going? How do we keep it clean? vibrant, beautiful, so people want to come here. We started the Clean and Safe team back in the 2000s. And those are things that we continue to do back here. We don't talk a lot about what we do. We are more because we have Suzanne on the team now, but we don't, we just do things. We make things happen. And it's really important that we also listen. You know, we have to listen to what our constituents say. That's what makes it and makes it happen. And then if you don't know what's happening, you know, it's our job to let you know. So advocacy is a huge part of what we do. Because again, and I'll state it again for my father, things were changing in the 60s at City Hall. No one knew about it in downtown. And it was really important that that was the catalyst to drive our development of the, of the Downtown Development Authority. So we are the authority of downtown that listens to City Hall, make sure our downtown team knows about it, and you all can help us make things happen. So with that, I also wanted to share just something new that's happening with us um, as we did jump in into this um, place of Old School Square, which is the heart of our city. It is the cultural arts center for our community. In 1986, the community came together. They rallied. They said, we want, we need to do something. There was a chain link fence. The community gathered. They made a performing and cultural arts center. And, you know, I'm just going to continue to say this. And I only say this, but my father's been here. He's 92 years old. He has served more than anyone and a lot of people. It took a village to make things happen. So you all are here today to continue to make things happen. But, again, the Downtown Development Authority is here to serve, to tr activate this cultural center through the summer and beyond to help and work with everyone to make uh, a vibrant place in the heart of our city. We have a beautiful beach, which is our number one asset, and this is just as important as it sits in the center of our town. So look for this summer. We'll be launching really starting next week. We're launching a series through the summer of concerts, events. We have a mural fest in July. We have a five-week art activation, our museum with the leadership of Maruska Gatto and all the docents that she has brought back that have spent 15 or plus years in the museum at Old School Square, devoting their life to the arts in our community, uh, is just spearheading that and is a tremendous asset to our team and to this, to this place called Dowry Beach. Um, and then as we go into summer, we, and I was just listening to the mayor talk about the summer, how do we get our residents back involved and come back downtown and be part of this community? So we heard you last year, and uh, with that, I'm going to introduce Suzanne real quick, and then we've got a few fun things to talk about. So uh, this is, Suzanne's going to talk about our summer campaign. So when everyone came in, you were asked to write on your um, name tag the one thing that you love about Delray Beach. I've lived here for 25 years, and... Um, I've seen a lot of changes in Delray Beach, but the one thing that has always stood out to me is the people. And, you know, that is what makes Delray Beach special, are the people. Um, there's, an, there's a relaxed energy about the people in Delray Beach. There's a kindness about the people in Delray Beach. And you don't find that in other places in the country and even here in South Florida. It's its own little 
um, bubble of happiness, I call it. <laughs> and so we started, we wanted to start a campaign um, because when you ask anyone what, you know, if that you're from Delray or you live in Delray, they're like, oh, I love Delray. <laughs> and so we wanted to come up with this summer of love Delray and really show our love to our locals. And so what is the summer of love Delray? Well, it's a DDA marketing campaign to show how much we love our locals. And it's very simple. Um, it's a 20% discount for anyone who lives in Delray Beach and comes to our downtown businesses and some of our um, chamber partners, because we are partnering with the chamber on this, um, that you get a 20% discount. Uh, most of our downtown hotels are already signed up. So the Seagate Hotel, Opal Grand, Courtyard by Marriott, Hyatt Place, Hampton Inn, the Aloft Hotel, you will get 20% off as a Delray local all summer. So from now, actually it starts Monday. So from Monday until the end of September, you will get 20% off if you're a Delray local. It's all for, also for surrounding um, cities. And some are offering it for all of Palm Beach County. Um, and then dozens of businesses are also participating. We have Playa Bowls and Deck 84 and the cart shop, spas, restaurants, um, Bar Envy, so um, workout, exercise places, they're all offering some kind of form of 20% off. Um, so how do you find out about this? Well, look for the Love Delray decal in the window. We're gonna be sending this to all the participating businesses and you can grab your phone and check out the QR code. This is our website. It's on our website, downtowndelraybeach.com slash Love Delray. So that's our Love Delray campaign. So Love Delray. And take the fans. And um, yeah, these are fans for all of you. Thank you. Thanks, Suzanne. Thanks, team. Um, all right, so I wanted to just also, um, this is a great quote from Jane Jacobs, who is a, a civic resident of New York City, who back in the 60s in her life, between 19, early 1900s through the 60s, was charged to really change downtowns. And she is um, an inspiration to me as a downtowner and in that industry. So I wanted just to share this because it's about everybody. And as I said before, it's about a community. So, so with that, I wanted to say some thank yous because we've got a great, um, tonight is about celebration, um, some milestones for the DDA. Um, we started back in 2016, 15, 16, with some, some in partnership with our police department, um, our uh, neighborhood services, really looking at our downtown, what's happening, some changes that were coming about, and what other towns were dealing with. And it was through the leadership of, actually, it was Sergeant Hunter at the time, who's now our assistant chief, uh, and our, actually, and uh, Russ Major, who's now our chief of police, and I think Jeff Razor also was on the police department at the time. We're in, and, and then Brian Bolston was our, on our DDA board. Uh, as one of our board members, I don't know if you were chair at the time, maybe leading into it, but really uh, backing us and saying we need to look at other downtowns, what are they doing to make it successful, and how do we make it successful here? Because we were dealing with, with some serious issues with our um, sober home issues, we had a lot of transient population, our unhoused, and it was, it was, a, it was an impact. So how do we make a difference? And um, I really applaud their efforts and support of our organization testing it. We did a pilot program which uh, in 2016. And then in 2018, when uh, Bob Gibbs was here, he really got the sentiment of the residents that said, we, they really like those yellow shirt guys. So it was with the support of that uh, program and really with the leadership of the police department um, that really made our downtown safety ambassador program. So tonight we wanted to recognize them and our clean and safe unit, and also another unit that is, I think, evolved from the, that um, back in about five years ago is uh, Ariana Cinco and the um, community outreach team who is instrumental in making this whole ecosystem work in our city. So I applaud you all. I want to invite everybody to come up. So first I'm, I'm going to 
um, recognize our ambassadors and one uh, person in particularly who has been with the team for probably four and a half years. And then we're going to uh, also invite the um, Clean and Safe and Ariana and team to come up as well because we have some recognition for you. But uh, Anderson Polkalet, who's our supervisor and has been here, and he's the one who really makes things happen on the street and a gem, a gem for all of us. So these guys work seven days a week, uh, day and night, and are an extra set of eyes and ears on the street for us. They um, meet our visitors and our residents, help with directions, help with uh, getting people and, and employees to their car at night. But they also deal with our um, those that are have you know, challenges in their life. And this is where the partnership comes in with our police department. They work super close with them and make sure that you know, they're in the know and can help and services are provided. Our community, we have some great partners here that do provide services for our unhoused and those that are um, in need of services. And it is, we serve on the homeless task force, which we met this morning, which is a huge collaboration uh, effort that does great work for the city. And you know, there are a lot of cities out there that are struggling, and we are, you know, doing a great job uh, every day here, and it is tough work, and I really appreciate everything that you and the team do. So we have a little bit here. Another mark. There you go. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Jack. We have Jack and Dale. Jack and Dale. Very good. Awesome. We have Emmanuel. Thank you, Emmanuel. You all stay up here with me and line up, and everyone takes pictures. Eddie. Uh, yeah. Eddie. Eddie couldn't here. make it today. Calix couldn't make it today. Aww. Yes, we Campbell. have Campbell. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Ariana and your team, if you want to come on up, please. And Sergeant Schmidt, if you want to bring your team up, too, please. I have a little gift for our outreach team. And um, Jimmy, do you all want to say, I want to just tell you a couple words. I want Ariana to say a couple words. Yes. She was really quiet today. We are the model for every other city in this county. We really are. They call us every day. What are you guys doing? How do you do it? Why do you guys look so great? Why come, how come our downtowns don't look like your downtown? And it's we talk to each other. We communicate. We care about each other. And we're here. Like we're, It takes a village to help one person. And that's what we do. Like we, we communicate all day long. It's a police department, a DDA. Everyone in this city just talks to each other and makes things happen and thanks to the Karen Kitchen and the Interfaith Committee and everything we have it's just we're awesome we really are so I'm just no DDA ever talks about this group like that and this is amazing so thank you, thank you. Oh, thank you. working together. Um, I don't think without every single one of these people working together, we would be as successful as we have been. So, and absolutely all of you guys, and the feedback we get, it really does help. Um, good does take a community to solve the crime that we do and keep the city as safe as we are. So, I appreciate it.
Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Do you want to get a picture? Mayor, do you want to come up and get a picture? Mayor, do you want to come up and get a picture with them, just real quick? Yeah. Ryan, do you want to come up and be in this picture since you were part of this program? And Mavis. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. All right. So now we also have another milestone. So um, and before I get started, I just saw that one of our other board members, uh, Dr. John Conde, arrive. So it's in the house. Um, so back in 2016, I think it might have been, again, 16 was a big year. So the and actually, before that, 2005, the Downtown Development Authority took over the substation up at um, A1A Atlantic Avenue uh, to develop a visitor information center. And it was a little, um, almost like a closet. It, and some, uh, Jean can, I think Jean is our only volunteer that actually participated in that space. But it, it functioned, it was volunteer based, and it worked because we really need a, a place, a satellite on that busy intersection to welcome visitors surrounded by hotels. Uh, but in 2016, it was really, took a look at it and said, it's time for a renovation. Uh, we, it has a great space, it has a great corner, beautiful parking, a great intersection. So with the collaboration with Missy Barletto, who was the, the assistant director of public works, I believe at the time, and other leaders of our city, and then our private sector jumped in, which uh, our architect, Roy Simon, who um, volunteered his time and service to renovate the space. And before that was a building, it was actually a community pool and where I learned to swim, where my father swam, where everybody um, gathered in that space. So it has a little bit of a, a, a feeling for us to wanted to make something special. So, so with that, it took about two years to develop, um, but it created this beautiful welcoming space as a visitor, visitor information center, which sees thousands of people a year that come in for guidance, things to do, maps, um, just anything and just really what does our volunteers want to know about it. So as we renovated the space and opened it up and created a more open, inviting space, we needed a team to actually run it. And with that, creating a, a concierge level of service. So before that, the DDA didn't have a staff person on, on staff to actually run this. It was really us trying to figure out between three of us how to make it happen. So really dedicating that and the board championing that and creating an actual person that had the experience, had the devotion and the passion and the love for Delray to make this space shine was our goal. And we found that in BJ Scalar, who is our Visitor Information Center coordinator. So um, BJ, would you like to come up? We have a little token of appreciation for you. So. And with that, you know, BJ came as a concierge um, in her past life as well as a uh, stewardess uh, with the airlines and brought a great deal of that customer service that we so need. So one thing that BJ said was that, ah. So BJ jumped on board in 2018, and she's like, I don't know, I've never worked, I've never worked with volunteers before. So <laughs> I'm like, you can do it, I know you can. So she took this and has really taken the Visitor Information Center as her passion and her life to make, um, make a welcoming space for the thousands of residents and visitors that come to our community from all over the world. And it is her mission to make sure that it shines bright every day. And now that we have the blue flag that is getting recognized on Friday, it's probably even more of a mission 
for uh, BJ to make a difference up there. So we also want to recognize our volunteers that, that do give. This is their job for them. They have a set position. They show up every day um, on their time and give 150% of their time to be there and um, share all the great things that are happening in our community. So I would love to invite all of our volunteers to come up that are here. We have a little certificate of appreciation for you and we'll get a picture. We actually have 21 people at our visitor information center. They take the time to go through training and learn everything that they possibly can share with all of the people that come into the center. And what is wonderful about the center is that we not only have visitors and guests from all over the world, we have residents that come into our center to get information that they can use to enhance their lives. And so these wonderful people uh, that take the time to come and be involved in the visitor center are extremely passionate, very trained, to make sure that they know everything that they can possibly share with people that come in the door to give a better experience to people in Delray Beach. Uh, so I am humbled and grateful for this unbelievable, if you knew the credentials of these people, of what they have done in their lives, and many are retired now, and decided that they wanted to give back to Delray Beach and be a part of making a difference and enhancing the whole lifestyle here. Uh, it is really something. And so we've become friends, and they're wonderful people. So I'm very happy to recognize them this evening. Uh, Elaine Sloan. Uh, and we have Donna Sayers. Okay. Uh, Denise Goldstein is not here. Yeah, many of them are not here. So. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we have Sandy Raisin and Lucille. We might as well just go right down the line. Linda and Jean and Joe and Alex and Joey V. And, uh, yeah, so we have 21 people, so they're not all here. <laughs> and Bob Cantwell. Right. So now that's why we're here. So we need to. Um, Bob's presentation's on here, right? Okay. I'll let you do that. So the the other milestone we have is um, our our organization uh, hired uh, Gibbs Planning Group back in 2017 to actually um, look at our downtown at a time we were going and going in a phase where there was um, some changes in our, our, we, our retail was struggling, rents were going up, properties were changing, and we had done a cluster study many years ago and wanted to look at our downtown and what we could do to make it more sustainable. We hired Gibbs Planning Group to look at our downtown and make recommendations to us as an organization as well as our city leaders and city staff and how we do that and created a shopability report as well as a market study. 
So we invited, um, after five years, we wanted to bring Bob Gibbs back and have him share with us, again, take a look at what our downtown looks like, how are we, how are we doing, and post-pandemic, uh, what can we continue to do and make us successful? So uh, without further ado, let's introduce uh, Bob Gibbs. Uh, thank you. It's uh, nice to be back, and it's really my, been my privilege to work with Laura and the DDA. Um, we quickly became, uh, we were quickly able to appreciate that Delray really is a can-do city. And when faced with a challenge, uh, quickly plans are adapted and implemented. And uh, working with Laura and the DDA in the community really has been one of the highlights of my career. And I've learned a lot from you, and I now call it the Delray Way. And it, the, what we've learned here and the way that the city is managed and, uh, and planned has really been influencing dozens and dozens of communities we work with around the country. And they literally know it as the Delray Way. And if I'm smart enough... Uh, I am a specialist in urban retail, and if you don't know this, Retailing is the hardest way to make a living. As a retail uh, operator, as a, either a developer or a store owner, you have to uh, be able to buy things a year in advance. Hopefully you can predict the right brands, the right colors, the right sizes, the right prices. And you have to uh, operate it like a business. And people are very fickle, and it's very, very challenging to do that. If you're the average 1,000-square-foot store, you have to earn $1,000 per day in sales to pay market rate rents, market rate operating expenses, and to get a market rate of return. Uh, right now, because of COVID and other reasons, about 30% of all retail space in the United States is vacant. I think it's almost, it's probably a zero here, which is a credit to the city. There, uh, one of the reasons is that the U.S. is overbuilt with retail. We have uh, the green as our retail. We have 22 square feet of retail per person in America compared to the other countries which have about two to three square feet of retail per person. Delray, though, has 100 square feet of retail per person and to a large degree because you're a resort community but also because of the urbanism and placemaking. This is one of the great places to go to in Florida, if not much of the country. And because of that, the city and the retailers really overperform your market. The uh, actuaries tell us that the city has about six and a half million square feet of retail. That would be about six garden smalls. The downtown area has approximately a million square feet of retail, which would be a large mega mall in the industry. Uh, we estimate that in the city, there's about $3 billion spent every year in retail and food and beverage, a major economy. We were very privileged to be asked to do a, what we call a shopability analysis for the city where we get into the weeds and we look at every inch of sidewalk, every tree, every parking policy, and uh, come up with a punch list of things that can be done from the shopper's point of view to make it a better place to visit and to make it more uh, to increase retail sales. Uh, one of the things we looked at, just simple things like sidewalk widths. We found in many places that the sidewalks are just too narrow because there's a light pole in the middle of them, and the city has an initiative right now to, adjust, to address that, a curbside uh, uh, plan which will make the sidewalks wider. We spent a lot of our time, uh, an unusual a lot of our time, looking at parking policies in the city, and, uh, which is always the major issue wherever we go. We looked at little things like streetscape, trash cans, lighting, the quality of lighting, how your trash cans are managed and painted. At the time, they were not managed very well, and there's been uh, uh, that issue has been largely corrected. 
We read your plans, and Delray likes to plan. They like to hire uh, consultants like us and do planning, which is all well and good. But this community actually implements the plans. They don't just sit around. The uh, Atlantic Avenue, for example, I believe was a Treasure Coast regional uh, plan 20, 30 years ago, and it got built. Uh, did I mention that we looked at parking? Uh, <laughs> Uh, we noticed uh, one of the uh, questions we were given is that um, nobody park, the shoppers don't park in your garages. What can we do? And we saw that the reason was the first level was reserved for valet parking, the second level for office parking, and the third level for retail and shoppers. Just a very simple management thing that the city was able to change. We looked at detail after detail like this, the crosswalks drive people right into the middle of the intersection was especially a problem with those with strollers or those that are disabled. So something we pointed out, something that the city has uh, begun uh, fixing right away. Uh, we still looked at things like wayfinding signage. Statistically, there's plenty of parking. Statistically, there's lots to do here. But you have so many visitors, it was hard for them to find it. So just simple things like wayfinding signage. And all in all, we came up with about 100 short-term, mid-term, and long-term recommendations that could be implemented. My wife and I, Beth, uh, came over here secretly and uh, studied the city about two months ago. And by my notes, the city's implemented about 80% of the recommendations that we made. <laughs> Largely because of Laura and the DDA, but the staff. That's an extraordinary high. Uh, we uh, usually bad about 300 and a really good plan about one third of it gets built so I take all the credit for it of course wherever I go I lecture and tell them how brilliant I was and how the city is because of me. Uh, the city has extraordinary demographics. I mean I'm a demographer, we do market research, there's a million visitors coming to the beach. This is one of the top visited beaches in the state. Those visitors spend uh, somewhere around 50, maybe 80 million dollars a year. We now have data that tells us where people live when they go into your stores. So uh, this is one of the stores, I can't read it, uh, Starbucks. Uh, we found that uh, Starbucks has 100,000 visitors a year. It's in the top half performing of all 6,000 Starbucks in the country. And this map lets us tell where you live after you visit the Starbucks. And your market, the, the market here really goes uh, extraordinarily far. It goes south, to Bo south beyond Boca. And a lot of Boca and a lot of residents, people that live within 15 or 20 miles, come here on a regular basis. A city of this size and a downtown of this size would typically have a five mile trade area. Your trade area is about four to five times that. Uh, again, because of the urbanism placemaking. Uh, since COVID, uh, everything has changed, of course. The big winner of COVID has been the small independent retailer. Uh, they are thriving, and in many of the cities in which we go, their sales have doubled every year since COVID. Um, the also big winner has been the restaurants. There's been tens of thousands of highly skilled restaurant chefs and workers who lost their job. And they borrowed money from their favorite uncle, and they had their brother-in-law build out a space, and they've taken new space, often in the worst location in the city, and built their own restaurants. The retail industry is thriving because of this, and these uh, small restaurant workers love to be in downtowns like Delray. The other big COVID winner has just been restaurants in general that have outdoor dining. In many cases, they're also having their best year. The loser of COVID has been the suburbs. Uh, especially us older commercial districts. Uh, these sales are tanking because they just sell commodities. They sell things that you can buy at Amazon online without the experience. Uh, and experience is what the next gen wants. Millennials of value doing things more than buying things. And when they buy something, if they don't buy it online, they want to buy it in a place like Delray Beach where they have a great experience, where they can meet people. Uh, the other loser has been these big box power centers. Uh, these centers are expected to, about 60 to 70 percent are expected to close within the next five years because the big boxes can't be big enough to compete with online shopping.
and you can buy anything in the boxes uh, much quicker. These will be great redevelopment opportunities. One of the uh, disappointments from my point of view, I'm, I'm one of the original new urbanists, is that the town centers that we have ad advocated for 30 years are not doing real well. Um, this is one of, one of the model ones out west. And uh, what's happened to these is they have so much debt and they're so interdependent on their financing that in this case, during COVID, when the hotels, the restaurants, the retail, and the office didn't go there, the residential tanked. Nobody wanted to live there. It became very unpleasant. And crime rised in these. So a lot of these are underperforming or going in foreclosure and or loan defaults. The other loser has been the classic enclosed regional mall. There's about 2,000 of these in the country. It's expected that over 1,000 will be closing by 2026 uh, for a lot of reasons. One of them is that they were designed for the family of four where the wife didn't work and the husband did. This family doesn't exist anymore. About half of the children born today are built, born to single parents. And shopping is no longer something that you do in the shopping mall for fun. It's a chore, something you have to do that you'd rather not do. Also, incomes have been flat. For the middle class, for the last 50 years, incomes have been very stagnant. And for millennials, incomes have gone down 20% in the last 10 years. Because of that, America likes Walmart. Walmart is twice as big in sales as Amazon. And about 50%, about one out of every two of you go to Walmart once a week. Walmart is the biggest retailer in every category. And again, shopping has gone from being something you would do for fun to something that you have to do. Uh, the other, because of that, the big winner has been small towns, especially resort towns. In this case, you're not just buying a pair of shoes, you're also having an experience, something you cannot get online. Uh, the big winner has been the middle-sized cities, the Greensboro, the Grand Rapids, these cities that are around 100,000 or 150,000. These are thriving because of the quality of life, because of the residential. The major cities are still struggling. Um, the office workers are down about 80% from what they were pre-COVID, and they're gone, they're empty on Mondays and Fridays. In the retail business, it's all about the money. Uh, about 10% of every dollar spent in your store goes to the landlord. So if you sell the $350 handbag, the landlord gets $35 of that. When you shop, you pay a 10% tax to the landlord. And in this industry, it's important to have enough sales so that you can pay your staff well and you can offer good, good uh, quality uh, goods and services. During COVID, the rents dropped down to 7% and many landlords dropped to just charging a percent rather than a base rent. Everything in my industry, the retail industry, is based on sales per square foot per year. That small retailer, that 1,000 square foot retailer, needs sales of about $400 a square foot per year. I was the planning director for a large uh, regional shopping mall, and uh, they had the highest sales in the country at $1,000 a square foot per year. The average mall does about sales of 350 a square foot. The luxury malls are about double of that. The small retailers whom, uh, who maybe had another career and switched to retailing only have sales of about $85 to $100 a square foot per year. And at that point, they're not paying themselves a wage. They are doing it almost as a hobby or hoping to get ahead. The resort areas have really exploded because of COVID. And on average, resort retail does about $1,000 to $2,000 a square foot per year. And we, uh, we do a lot of uh, work in resort communities and for a lot of the large theme parks. And what we found is that when people go on vacation, if they go skiing or if they're going to the beach, they actually now spend more time shopping than they do skiing or going to the theme park. And uh, in that case, shopping has been an experience for them. The surprise is that 
when they shop on vacation, when they go to Big Sky or uh, wherever, uh, they like to buy the same brands they buy at home. They like to shop in the cute little boutique store, but they do that for recreation and for, for something to do. But when they actually get out their credit card, they actually want to buy the same things they buy at home, except they want to buy a little better. They'll go up two or three grades of a watch because when they go home, uh, that is part of the vacation. It extends the vacation for them. The Apple Store, uh, on average, produces $5,000 a square foot per year. And the Apple Store in New York, in the basement, produces $66,000 a square foot per year, which is the highest in the world. The average uh, high quality or national retailer in a mall does about six fifty a square foot per year. And when those malls close, about 1,000 will be closing in the next three years, they only give these retailers uh, five to six months notice. And uh, when that happens, the retailers very much want to stay in the market, but they want to locate in a real city with a real main street because they know that the experience counts too. When they go into a city, um, they will build or renovate a building to a very high quality, and they like to go in cities that are very well managed, especially with downtown development authorities. And I'll get back to that in a minute. The challenge with that is that um, when a William Sonoma or Warby Parker or a Jay McLaughlin go to a city and say, I want to open a store here, um, they're usually given the cold shoulder and they're usually told no. We do not want uh, a William Sonoma in our downtown because it's a chain and it'll ruin our quality of life. They do like, though, well-managed cities like uh, Delray with the DDA where there's a plan, a policy um, to make it safe and to make it clean and to make it uh, well-marketed. Uh, they also like to go to downtowns that have a plan, um, what's called a merchandising strategy. And even though there are different property owners, they like to know that maybe there will be a fashion district over here where there might be eight or ten retailers there, maybe an entertainment or restaurant district over there, in theory. That will never be implemented 100%. Um, and they like to go in groups. They're called the Dirty Dozen. There's about 12 to 15 retailers that like to stay together. And they will not very often go to one uh, place by themselves. They like to go in groups. Now, uh, home furnishings and fashion is a nice thing to have in a city. Um, it appeals to the tourists. It appeals to the residents. It has a low demand on parking. And it really can provide the quality of life and provide the goods and services that you can't get anymore in the suburbs or the mall. Uh, it's very easy to have restaurants in downtowns. They can pay high rent. Uh, and everybody likes to, who doesn't like to shop outside and dine outside? Uh, Del Rey has a great amount of restaurants. I wouldn't say it's an entertainment district. It the Atlantic really has a good balance of fashion, home, specialty services, and restaurants. Um, entertainment, though, can get out of balance. And if it does get out of balance, it can have a negative impact on other land uses. The noise of outside dining can hurt residential values. Uh, re retailers, uh, Restaurants take twice to three times the parking that retail does. And all in all, it should be really kept in some sort of balance. The specialty uh, maker, the services, the hair salons, the barbers, the tailors, the interior designers have a role in downtowns. They have to locate in the B and C streets where there's, not a, uh, where there's lower rents. And these businesses really are the beginning of the food chain for the retail. These are often incubator businesses that will open uh, a small starter store and grow to a Main Street store, but they bring people to the downtown on a regular basis for services uh, whom will then go to the restaurant or they may shop and do other things. And a lot of downtowns have policies that require retail on side streets. A lot of developers will say that's not going to work, but it's really good to keep that policy. It gives a place for that incubator, that starter retailer, or that hair salon that the other retailers need. 
Uh, the streetscape is extremely important to the public realm. Um, and I'm going to talk about streetscape in a moment. Um, but parking uh, probably is the most important thing to have a vibrant downtown. Uh, this is a, a page out of our shopability book. We found that Delray had almost 40 different policies for parking, 40 different choices, which is overwhelming, of course. Now, that's been streamlined down to just a handful, a credit to you. But at the time, uh, this required a lot of study and a lot of research to figure out where you're going to park. We estimate that every on-street parking space that is metered for a city of over 10,000 people generates about $175,000 to $200,000 per year in retail sales. Every space that turns over five times a day generates about $200,000 in sales per space. Two spaces are enough to support an, a complete store just from those spaces. We very often find that store owners like to park directly in front of their store. Uh, it's a God-given right, they believe. This is a store owner in Cape Cod who parks there every day from 8 in the morning to 8 at night. Um, she, her number one complaint with the city is that there's not enough parking. And uh, I, you know, almost everybody in that street parks in front of their store. Um, meters are a necessity, especially in season. The meter kiosk, uh, which I know you have here, are difficult for a lot of people to navigate. Uh, they require that you can read and follow directions. <laughs> and for a lot of us, that's just hard, especially when you get a little bit older. And uh, this is a new town on the left in, uh, in Dallas. Um, and in the new towns that we design, we put meters in the prime spaces, not for the revenue. In fact, all of the revenue goes to charity. We put the meters there to get it to turn eight to ten times per day, and then we provide free parking in the structures or the surface lots, which Delray does here. There's free parking until five or six o'clock at night. That's extraordinary. That is the most generous parking policy we've seen anywhere. It, I, I thought we were good in my city in Birmingham. We have two hours of free parking. Um, it's a great policy. I'm glad you're doing it. The problem with the kiosks, though, is they are hard to use. And uh, in this case, this is in uh, California, there were two people that did not know how to use them and there was a line of 15 people waiting to get their turn. And time is money. It's all about the money. And I'd rather have those 15 people um, in my store rather than waiting. I know it's very controversial, but if you, re if you redo your parking policy someday, I highly recommend that you consider going to the old fashioned meters where you can put a quarter in, or a credit card, or use your iPhone. It is the way to go. It's also important here to have good wayfinding signage. Uh, you have a lot of people that are here for the first time. This is the wayfinding signage in Naples on 3rd Street. Uh, the signage works better when it's horizontal, and it says you are here, here's all the furniture stores, here's all the restaurants, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it is important for a city of your size to really have a fashion district or to have a place to buy soft goods. It doesn't have to be designer fashion, but you, Delray is at the size of a place that you really should expand the number of soft goods stores where you can shop here for shoes or clothing or furnishings or art and where you don't have to go online or you don't have to go on the mall to get it. These retailers have to be recruited. You have to identify whom you want, where they can go, work with the landlords, and just let them know that they're welcome to come here because they are usually told no. One of the extraordinary things also is the public realm in Delray. You have a great tree canopy, great urbanism. It's a very, very beautiful town, as you know. Uh, this is a must for the, the top retailers they want to go in places that, have, that are pretty, that are nice to look at. That tells them that it's a well-managed place. And if they spend a lot of money opening their store, if they have extended hours and well-trained staff, they know that they will do well and it'll attract others. Uh, streetscapes are deceiving. Uh, the main thing about streetscapes is they have to be wide. 
Uh, for a city of this size, your sidewalks from building to curb should be about 12 feet wide, and there should be at least eight feet clear where people can walk all of the time for eight feet because of the crowds here. There, I mean, the sidewalks are almost New York quality crowds. That has to be done. There's innovative ways I know the city is looking at to redesign your sidewalks to permit that. They do not have to be expensive, though. This is Beverly Hills in California. Um, the sidewalks can just be simple concrete or well-designed materials. Uh, Worth Avenue has concrete sidewalks, for example, but they have to be cleaned regularly. Uh, even little things like trash cans are important. Your cans should be painted, all of your fixtures, your light poles and everything, really should be painted once a year. You can just buy high quality automotive paint or something, and uh, this tells the shopper that they're, in a, that they're gonna get good service, that it's a place where they feel safe, and it's just a very subtle thing you can do. And then in a resort town like this, you should use some color, green, blue, something like that, uh, to make it look uh, more festive. Uh, everybody likes art right now. There's great art galleries here. And for the top fashion retailers, the soft good retailers, they want to be where there's art, and they want to have uh, good designs. They want to build modern stores or well-designed traditional stores. Um, this is an extreme. This is an Hermes in Europe where the store is made out of concrete um, or a glass block. It's also important to have good signage, which Delray has, but the signage should be more flexible now than it used to be to encourage three-dimensional signs. The new thing about windows is to allow windows to be smaller than we would of 10 years ago. 10 years ago, we were requiring windows to be 80, 85, maybe 90 percent. Today, because of energy and, and such, uh, we're reducing that down to about 60 percent as long as they're clear glass. I know it's hot here, you get direct sun. There's other things that can be done, shades and such, that can mitigate the, the sun. And then just the public realm, again, has to be beautiful. Um, some cities, the, in some cities, the, the uh, bid will uh, plant flowers. They'll put in window boxes in front of the stores and plant and water them. Um, it's good to strive for the X factor, which is that undefinable factor that makes you feel in love with where you're at. And really, Atlantic and Delray has that. Um, I, I, I read about Coco Chanel, the fashion designer, and she said she would know that her dress is, is, is good when people would compliment her customers by saying that they look beautiful when she wears her dress. If people would say she had a beautiful dress, then she knew she was unsuccessful. And that's what the X factor is about, and I think that's something that Delray has very much. You have that X factor that's rare, that's in high demand from all generations, the, uh, the demographics want it, the retailers want it, and it's a very sustainable way to go. So credit to you for what you've done here, and thank you very much for including me in your planning. Thank you, Bob. Thank you for being here. We have, um, now we have time for questions, um, so I wanted to thank you for taking the time to highlight what the success has been, and it is a tribute to your leadership, um, our staff. Uh, we have Anthea Genotis here from our uh, development services team who has taken um, your plan and implemented a lot of those, um, those tactics as well. So thank you for that. But I wanted to open up tonight, um, and also just before they leave, I want to highlight our Windy City Pizza uh, team over here. They have great food still, so feel free to gav gather more. And then um, I thank our ladies, Michelle and Claudia, uh, my sister-in-law, uh, who's here to help us with our uh, beverages. So, But let's open it up. Anybody have questions for Bob, for us, uh, anything you want to say? We do have a microphone, so we're going to walk around and get the questions. So hold on. Thank you. 
Hi. Um, so one of the things I want to talk about, and um, Bob, we can have more nuanced conversations about regulations at a different time, so I don't want to get too wonky, which I tend to do. But I think one of the pressures we have downtown is the only thing that keeps um, some of the streets from going 100% food and beverage and restaurant is the parking requirement that we have, that they have to meet if they change the use. And uh, we attached really what we thought were really expensive buyout options to keep um, you know, the restaurants from just buying out that requirement. But I, I think for us, the, the retail is really in competition with the restaurant and bar industry downtown. And, and any guidance you can offer in terms of that balance, I think would be useful for us. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, it is important to have a balance. Uh, realtors will tell you that houses have a 20 to 30 percent premium when you can walk to shops and restaurants. In fact, many of them will say you're so many steps from a Whole Foods. The Whole Foods effect is a 25 percent effect. That becomes a negative if you, have, if you are a true entertainment district where you have bars and clubs and restaurants that take the parking up, that litter the sidewalks, that cause havoc, and really have noise. So I don't know what the, the balance would be here, but there should be a balance. There should, to be a, uh, a fashion or shopping district, you really need about 35 or 40 stores to have that balance. And the market is here. You're, Delray is one of the only communities in the country that has such a strong market that you really could be almost anything you want to be in the downtown. You could be a strong home furnishings market, a strong market for young families and children with toys and sporting goods, you have those options. Uh, but it has to be in balance. And I am concerned, I don't know about here, but generally I'm concerned. And there have been cities that we've worked in that became entertainment districts that drove out the retail and brought down the housing and office values very quickly. Hello, uh, my name is Vera Woodson. I sit on the board of the Downtown Development Authority. Um, in my former life, I uh, was a buyer and a regional merchandise manager for Nordstrom, who just uh, arrived on the scene, the rack, um, discount clothing, obviously. And uh, I taught economics and marketing. So this is very intriguing. My entire cell phone feed is about retail and everything um, because it's just the heartbeat of who I am. Um, I, one of the things I want to ask in terms of small downtowns and small town feel, I, I love that Delray keeps that um, small town feel. but Usually, one of the things that we were known for when I was at Nordstrom as a buyer is finding that next niche market of what it is that's needed to keep customers thinking that we're innovative and ahead of the curve. So what are you seeing? I, I've seen um, in my feed that now some of these malls that are closing, they're turning the big box stores into pickleball courts. Um, so I'm trying to figure out what is it that the small towns are trying to do to be innovative that you've researched for that next thing so we can get ahead of the curve. Thank you. Uh, I think it's, this is, believe it or not, this is very controversial, but I think downtowns should sell the goods and services that the community wants, even the brands they want. And uh, that's going to be up to your demographics of what your community wants to get the shopping here. The big trend right now, um, the big trend right now is to have small, uh, s small chain stores where they might have 50 or 100 stores like a Jay McLaughlin or a Sarah Campbell. But your demographics, your urbanism, your leadership, your management, and your location are such that you, Delray could really be almost any number of things that you'd want to be. It could be all restaurants and bars. The market is strong enough here that it could be. I don't recommend that. And that will take some action to uh, balance that out. I hope I help. Anybody else? Uh, hi. The, the, as we were emerging from COVID, there was some discussion, I believe, in the City Commission. I don't know exactly what, what discussion took place. But it was the thought of maybe closing Atlantic Avenue down to vehicular traffic a certain number of nights a week to try and stimulate you know, more pedestrian throughput, give restaurants more space. I uh, just wonder what your thoughts were about doing that and whether that's something that's even on the agenda right now. Thank you. And the question is, what about closing Atlantic Avenue down, narrowing it, 
maybe all pedestrian, maybe pedestrian a few days a week, maybe one way. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, if I'd been, when I was 76 years younger and I was here, I would have said no, no, no. Uh, but things change. Yes, I, uh, I, your sidewalks need to be widened. You need to be more pedestrian. You have the pedestrians, but you need the infrastructure. So yes, one way, uh, you know, none of us liked, urban planners liked one way uh, until we went to Worth Avenue and other places and saw they really do work. So one way, maybe shut it down, uh, especially in the off season where you uh, need more traffic. But our, our feeling is try it, be bold, try it temporarily, what they call tactical urbanism, try it. If it doesn't work, then, you know, blame your consultant and, uh, and do something else. You have to try, you have to keep trying. But yeah, I think one, one way or maybe temporary street closures would be the way to go. You have to work though with the retailers. It could be you have a block or two where that's just not gonna work where those stores depend on that traffic going by and the chance to park there. So it has to be really calibrated. Anyone else? Okay. Hi, everyone. Paul Pizzino, Beach Keepers. Thanks for the conversation. It's a nice topic. I think one of the important reasons our success in this community is there's a number of people that embraced the cleanliness, the culture of cleanliness we share here. So you're right, clean garbage pails, stuff like that, play a huge role. They discourage people. So it's nice to see them available. I don't know if we touched on that much, but a clean community is a welcoming community, no doubt. And we try to protect that value every day. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the comment is that Delray is special. You are a welcoming community. You're a friendly community. Uh, people actually acknowledge you, look in your eye and say hi. It's very friendly. And uh, it's just a very well-managed, very beautiful city. And if you, if, if, if you were a shopping center developer and you wanted to build the most competitive shopping center, and I hate to use that term, is you would design it exactly like Delray. You are exactly the model that the retailers and the families and the demographics want to be at. And I'm not saying make you into a mall. Uh, that'd be the worst thing you could do. But you, uh, Delray, it's exactly where the market has shifted to. Okay, thank you. So excited to have you back here, Bob. And you were so instrumental in so many of the things that we did do downtown that I think have, has made a difference and really actually brought us through COVID in a, in a very positive way when I compare us to some of the other um, municipalities, both to the north and south of us. The question I have for you is this. There's always the pressure of changing what we have that seems to be so right because the buildings may not be exactly what people are looking for to move into or may not <clears throat> accommodate their business. How important is it to what we have going on downtown to preserve that moving forward than to allow for the changes that are we're always under pressure to do to the actual infrastructure of the buildings? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I think you have to embrace change to a point. A lot of communities, we're just working in a community in Franklin that won't let you paint the brick because in 1890, paint hadn't been invented or something and they won't let you do it. But you have to change it, but the urbanism has to stay here, which you have. There's a height limitation along Atlantic Avenue, which is brilliant. Or it can be taller on the side, you've got the trees. But um, to be competitive, and to, to uh, work with the next gen, you have to have change. And you have to be willing to take a risk, make a change. If it doesn't work, uh, you know, try something else. But, and I think Delray does it. I think you're very open to change, to try new. Um, I think that's one of the reasons you're so well. Okay. All right, th thank you very much. It's glad to be back here. Thank you, everybody. So, any other questions? Oh, yes. To address our parking and also our traffic, 
downtown uh, Delray Beach, Atlantic Avenue in particular when it's the height of uh, our restaurant uh, dining time. We have a service called freebies and at one time we had a trolley. What are your thoughts? The freebies operate by calling a number and requesting a pickup. It would appear to me that if those freebies were available at your parking garages to operate, let's say, 12 vehicles and be able to take a party of four or four different uh, customers to various locations within downtown Delray, you might eliminate some of the congestion or you might put it at ease for those especially who might be disabled in walking um, and you know, need uh, to get close to a restaurant or to a store. Any thoughts on inner city uh, vehicles for transporting? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, parking management is extremely hard and it has to be curated, but a big element is to uh, find ways of getting cars off the street. So they can be intercepted, park in a garage, maybe take, take that freebie transportation, maybe just have it more walkable with the wayfinding signage and such. But in a resort town like this, unfortunately, during your two months or whatever it is, um, you're going to be over, you're, you're going to be inconvenienced with traffic. If Atlantic were designed so that you wouldn't have traffic congestion during those two months, it would not be walkable. And that's the downside. But there is a city grid here. You can, there are things that could be done to relieve it, but that's the downside of having a, a, a successful city is you're going to be, you're going to have congestion. But it has to be managed. And I agree with you. I, I, uh, I live in another city in the southwest part of the state, I won't mention. And, uh, you know, they have a horrific, for eight weeks you can't get into the city with traffic. Luckily they have a grid. But it's got to be balanced. I hate to be a cliche, but it has to be balanced. But um, did I mention parking? <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. So it is, and that's a good question, and those are good points. So uh, volunteers do hear a lot from um, our community members, so making sure that you're continuing to feed us as planners and uh, those that, that run the city those ideas, because that's how and what you're hearing from the constituents, too, because you're the front line, and our business owners and our retailers are the front line. So it's really instrumental. But it is, um, you know, that's something that, again, I know I said it earlier, but we are a voice and we are a resource as the Downtown Development Authority as a management organization, as Bob mentioned. But so communicate to us. Share your thoughts. Share your ideas. Share your, your vision. Um, and pain points that you know we can help guide our officials, guide our teams that make the plans work. Uh, that's what we're here for. So we have, um, we're here, we're in the town, we're everywhere. So make sure that you're communicating with us always. Um, and it is important for us to guide that the plan and as we move forward and, and keep on top of the next uh, trends. So we just really want to make sure that we're in the know and we appreciate um, Bob's insight and what he's been able to do for us. So, and appreciate our leaders that listen, you know, that really do listen and make a difference. But I thank you all for being here. If there's not any other questions and um, we'll say good night and just thank you all for your time. And really quickly, when you leave, um, grab a Love Del Rey water bottle on your way out and don't forget to Take the fans when you go as well. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night.